Um, so hello everyone. Thank you so much for coming to my talk today and everyone else's research talk. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the research I conducted with Professor Willis Wiegand. Here we focused on the synthesis and characterization of three shift-based constant isomers and their respective copper two complexes. So oops, before we begin, um, one, I'm going to get a laser pointer out. And then two, um, I kind of want to give a little bit of yeah, I can't click to the next slide, we'll just do this. Uh, a little bit of history about shift bases. So shift bases were first reported by Hugo Shift in 1864 in literature. Um, this is Hugo Shift over here on the right. He looks really scary, but apparently he was a real big teddy bear. So that's pretty cool. But anyways, a little bit more about his work. He's most known for his work with shift bases as his last name might suggest, as well as aniline. Um, and you know, shift bases are really found everywhere um, from biological systems to industrial and also uh, th th therapeutic systems as, as well. Um, a lot of their potentiality for all of these different industries derives from their functional group, um, an imine, which is their defining functional group. And for those who don't know what an imine is, this is essentially just a carbon nitrogen double bond, which is seen here. And with this carbon nitrogen double bond, we see that we have a beautiful orthogonal lone pair of electrons. Um, and really this orthogonal lone pair of electrons is what really is where all of their, its, its characteristics kind of derive from. And as another refresher, if you don't know what orthogonality is or uh, don't remember, orthogonality when we're thinking about electrons is going to be essentially where they're going to occupy a P orbital, which is 90 degrees or perpendicular to the orbital that is partaking in a double bond, or in this case, this pyridine ring, partaking in a resonant system. So now that we've kind of talked about their basic um, properties uh, deriving from their uh, amine, now let's talk about their formation. And so here I'm going to show you a mechanism. Um, so typically we're going to see that uh, shift bases are going to be formed through the primary or through a reaction between a primary amine and a carbonyl. Typically, the first step will be a protonation of the carbonyl. This protonation then generates a rather positive charge, which, is, which can be spread off of this oxygen group here and this carbon. This creation of this little bit more electrophilic area then allows for a nucleophilic attack at the carbon position, which then pushes these pi, pi electrons up to the alcohol. Once we're at this state, we then have a deprotonation to neutralize the positive charge on the nitrogen. And then we then get this structure. What's great about this structure is we also, we have this alcohol and this alcohol can accept another proton, which will create another, uh, or actually not another, but will create a leaving group. And for those who don't know, OH2 is a really great leaving group because when it leaves, it's gonna be a stable molecule with no positive charge. So this is where the condensation part of this reaction comes from. After this occurs, we're then going to see that we have to deprotonate our nitrogen here to get rid of its positive charge. Thus, upon deprotonation, we form a shift base. And we know this is a shift base for two reasons. One, the orthogonal lone pair, which would be generated here. And two, the defining functional group and imine. So now that we've talked about imines in some depth, and then also the synthesis of shift bases, why are we even studying them? And who really cares about these, these compounds? So shift bases, if we recall, have that amine and they have that orthogonal lone pair. This orthogonal lone pair gives them a lot of benefits to industrial processes, such as this compound here on the right, this cobalt compound, uh, which is commonly utilized as a phase transfer catalyst in phase chemistry. And for those who don't recall what phase chemistry is, this is essentially where you're going to have a reactant that is not dissolvable in say an organic phase, but is dissolvable in an aqueous phase. And then you're allowed to essentially bind the uh, reactant to the catalyst, and then it'll drive it to the other phase of the reaction. They also have a lot of applications in uh, the realm of biology, where this compound here on the right was recently reported as a promising uh, chemotherapeutic. One of its limiting drawbacks was it had a rather high dose limiting effect. Um, so these are just two of the, you know, a plethora of shift bases that have been recently reported. Um, but majority of these reports don't account for all of their properties. And so that was kind of the starting point for our research. We really wanted to say, okay, let's identify some shift bases that have been reported and see if we can analyze their coordination. And so we combed through literature and we found three reduced forms of shift bases. And a reduced form is essentially where we're just going to add this hydrogen here and get rid of the amine. And we found that, you know, A, 
looked at its uh, photophysical effect. B and C then looked at this reduced forms coordination capabilities. But we were really intrigued because they didn't report their reduced or their non-reduced form at all. They just kind of mentioned it in the synthesis and didn't do any characterization or for that matter, any uh, coordination reactions. And so that's where our research derived from. We really wanted to see, okay, what are the coordination capabilities of these three compounds? And also, is there any difference between them? We were really interested in L3 because it has the capability to be a bidentate ligand, which we'll discuss a little bit later on. So now to jump into the synthesis. So the syntheses for L1, L2, and L3 were all adopted from literature slightly and then modified. L1 um, basically consisted of a solution of DMF and um, our four purity and carboxyl aldehyde, which is this group here, and then a solution of ethanol and five amino isothalic acid, which were then introduced. We went ahead and tried this same synthetic route for L1 at first with L2 and L3, but we found that the reaction mixer generated quite a bit of heat and locked up and basically solidified. Uh, upon characterization, we couldn't really conclude what was going on here. So uh, we did a lot of, you know, reaction teetering and tried to figure out what was going on. But we went ahead and found another um, synthesis that has been reported for L2, and we adapted it to L3 to see what might uh, happen. And thankfully, after characterization, we found that our syntheses were successful. Uh, a little bit of an interesting note, they were successful in varying yields. Uh, which kind of is expected. Uh, L1 was synthesizing the 61% yield, L2, 80, and L3, 90. We were really excited about this L3 yield because this hasn't been reported in literature before, and that's a relatively decent yield, uh, at least in our opinion. So after we got the characterization data, we were really happy with this, but as you might know, the gold standard for any sort of structural determination is going to be obtaining some sort of X-ray diffraction data. And so we went ahead and subjected each of these ligands to crystallization techniques, but we only really were able to do this with one of the ligands, which was L2. Uh, and so we actually generated a very beautiful crystal structure of L2, which had a little bit of disordered and solvent uh, residues that were present. But as far as the structure itself, it came out really nice. Um, and we know that it's an amine, or we know it's a shift phase once again, because it has this amine between N2 and C9. We also found that there was a lot of uh, interesting pi stacking occurring between the respective shift bases and the crystal structure, um, which was just kind of an interesting finding. So after we went ahead and you know, we, we confirmed our synthesis for our shift bases, our respective ligands, we then went ahead and said, okay, let's analyze their coordination capabilities. And so with each of the coordination reactions, we decided to use copper two acetate as our, uh, our, our metal of choice, our transition metal, uh, largely because copper has really good effect, or capabilities of creating coordination complexes. Um, and then also this was one of the more readily available uh, reagents that we had in the lab. We decided to use ethanol as our solvent of choice, largely because we found that the solubility of both copper acetate and our respective ligands was relatively high, uh, and it gave us a decent, a, a decent reaction. Now, as far as the actual coordination goes, we aren't comfortable with definitively saying that, you know, the complex is a certain co coordination. Instead, we, we found that our characterization data suggested that potential coordination occurred, but it wasn't something that we felt comfortable definitively saying. That being said, we did hypothesize some potential structures given that the ligand would be a bidentate ligand. Uh, and for those who don't, do not know what bidentate it means or what denticity is in terms of ligands, this essentially means uh, it's the amount of times that a ligand will bind to a metal or for better terminology, will form a bond with the ligand. It's important to note here that the first structure on the left and the last structure are more probable to actually have occur than the middle structure because square planar molecules typically only occur whenever the transition metal, in this case M, is going to coordinate correspond to copper two uh, is a D9, or sorry, my apologies, is a D8 metal. And in this case, copper two is not a D8 metal. So the square planar um, orientation is completely off the table. So with that being said, um, we really wanna focus on the future on improving our crystallization techniques. And the reason why that is, is because we wanna obtain those high quality X-ray diffraction uh, data 
So that way we can definitively say our ligands are the ligands that we have. And then also that our coordination complexes are the coordination complexes that we are looking for and trying to analyze. And another kind of interesting side project that I would really love to do, um, granted I had more time, is I wanna analyze the antimicrobial effects of these shift bases and then also potentially the coordination compounds. And the reason why this is, is because Amines are really a fascinating functional group and provide a lot of opportunity for future studies. Uh, amines have been found to provide antimicrobial effects, uh, and that's kind of the reason why I want to look at the antimicrobial effects of our shift bases to see if there's any prevalent um, capabilities there. Uh, and so, with that, I would like to thank the Welsh Foundation for their support. Um, I would also like to thank Professor Gazinski for all of the help that he has uh, provided uh, throughout the two years that I was working on this project. I would come to him with many times with synthesis-based questions, and I know he was probably like, please get out of my office, but it really did help. And then finally, uh, not finally, I would also like to thank Dr. Joseph Riebenski at a and uh, He helped with the determination of the crystal structure. He solved it completely. Um, and it was really, I was really thankful for that. And then finally, Professor Wigan, thank you so much. Um, you really inspired a lot of chemists throughout your time here at Southwestern and I couldn't have asked for a better research advisor. And with that, I would like to conclude my presentation and please, please, please ask tons of questions. I'm eager to answer them. Very good, Ethan. Um, let's see, Dr. Wigan, questions? You're muted. Maybe, maybe Ethan, maybe we ought to just stay here another year. And, I think so. Uh, I, I think, yeah, I think so. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> no, not really. Good job. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, let's see, um, Rachel. Hi, Ethan. You look really Hi. good. Thanks, Rachel. You did too. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I was wondering in the literature, um, what if you had seen or and um what kind of antimicrobial effects you had seen uh, have been studied from the shift bases? Yeah, um, so the actual term I am blanking on, but what I found was that shift bases in general, instead of killing off the bacteria um, and the, yeah, the bacteria, they instead prevent growth. Um, and that primarily derived from their capability from their amine. Um, the amine functional group is really interesting because it can be utilized in a lot of, as we learned from this presentation, uh, a lot of different capabilities. So my theory is that it's something to do with forming some sort of coordination site with, I guess, I, I'm not entirely sure, but I do know that it prevents growth of the bacteria instead of uh, actually just killing it. Cool, thank you. That's really interesting. <laughs> Let's see Dr. Niemeyer. Thanks so much, Ethan. That was a really great talk. Um, I'm wondering, and maybe if you knew the answer to this, it would solve all inorganic chemists, you know, burning questions. But um, if you had the L1, L2 and L3 and they're all, I mean, they have similarities in their structures. Why was it that only one of them could crystallize out? So do you know, is there something about the structure of the, the L2 that made it particularly amenable to, um, you know, forming a crystal or did it have something to do with the solvents you were using? Or I guess, conversely, is there something in the structures of L1 and L3 that make them particularly challenging to crystallize. I'm just wondering why that one was so special yeah. that you could get a crystal structure. So uh, it, crystallography is always kind of, a, as, as you probably know, it's just an interesting realm because it's thought of as like, you kind of have a skill for it. Um, but to really kind of dive into it, and I actually learned this this year in Professor Delinio's course, um, what the method of crystallization that I utilized was vapor diffusion. Um, and so essentially we utilize the mother liquor. So in this case, it was gonna be some of the methanol left over. And then from that methanol or in, into that methanol, we added DEF um, and this was gonna act as the precipitant. And so as the 
ethanol or methanol evaporated off, basically, um, you then see that more interactions are going to occur with the DEF and the actual structure. And mm -hmm. it's really based off of how it orders in, in its unit cell. You want to see high order. Um, and I think truthfully, I got lucky. I, I, I want to completely be completely honest. I got lucky with L2 crystallizing out. L3 is also an oil. Um, this is something that I didn't mention, but L2 and L3 were obtained as oils, whereas L1 was obtained as a solid. So L2 and L3, as far as getting adequate concentrations for crystallization, which is typically, typically you want your concentration of your ligand or whatever you're crystallizing out to be relatively moderate. Um, with respect to the precipitant, I was able to obtain that with L2. L1, on the other hand, was more difficult to play around with its concentration. Um, but yeah, as, as a really long-winded answer, I hope that answered. I, I was lucky. Um, <laughs> okay. There are a lot of methods that you can utilize for crystallization. Um, and as for, I was really interested, I didn't get a chance, but I wanted to use um, the hanging drop method, which is utilized primarily in uh, protein structure crystallization, where mm -hmm. you kind of have first delineo. I'm sorry if I do this wrong, but you essentially have like the crystal in, um, or your, your structure in your solvent and your precipitant, and then you have like a well underneath it which has mm -hmm. your solvent there as well. And so you slowly have your solvent diffuse out, which then allows your precipitant to crystallize your structure. Um, and that was something that I wanted to do, but I just, I ran out of time. Fair enough. Cause you said L3 was the one that hasn't been synthesized before, right? So yeah. So that was the one you probably like to get a crystal structure of, right? So yeah. you can show it to the world, so. Yeah, I was really, yeah really excited about this one here because um, if you also, the, the reason why L3 was exciting for another reason is it has potentiality to be a bidentate ligand because this, this single bond here has slight double bond characteristic, but you can imagine that this can rotate. Um, and mm -hmm. then you have two coordination sites, which would be really, really cool. Mm, nice, thank you, Ethan. Thank you. Let's see, Dr. G. Yeah, I think crystallization is always, if organic molecules is always, it always is by luck. That's kind of the, the nature of organic crystals, unfortunately. Just oftentimes, inorganic crystals tend to act more sanely, I suppose, <laughs> uh, in that sense. Sometimes. Sometimes, yeah, yeah. not always. But um, uh, so, so I guess I have, I have three questions, although the first one is just one that I've always wondered. So these imines are called shift bases. What's the difference between the term imine and the term shift base? Like I've always, they've just, they just always been meant the same thing to me. I wasn't sure if you had. Yeah, to me, like I, I read a review paper that kind of just said an imine is a shift base and the shift base is an imine. Um, as far as, you know, the exact terminology, I haven't found a difference. I think it's one of those things where people call it one thing and then that's what they call it. It's like kind of like, tomato, tomato. Um, but yeah, that, yeah, that's always been kind of scratching in the back of my head as well. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. I, I just wasn't sure if there was some kind of something I was missing because I, I always just have found that inorganic chemists call it shift bases and organic chemists call it imines. <laughs> um, so uh, could you go back to the slide that you had that had the previously synthesized reduced versions of mm -hmm. this? So if you were to compare the ligand ability of A, B, and C versus the ligand ability of L1, L2, and L3, which one of them, which set would you expect to be a stronger ligand and why? Okay, um, yeah. So I would expect the actual shift bases too. Um, and my reasoning is largely because that orthogonal lone pair is completely available with respect to the actual amine. Um, because I mean, if you think, let's go back a little bit. So my reasoning is, you know, this lone pair is completely perpendicular to the resonant system. And so for that reason, there's no possibility that this could participate in any sort of resonance. So it's widely available for any sort of dative bond formation. Now I recall from organic or inorganic that we talked about how sometimes amines are really beautiful coordination sites as well, but I venture to say that this would be a little bit stronger. 
It, I think it's an interesting interplay between two different ideas, right? Mm -hmm. So, so what you're describing is absolutely true, um, but it's also true that that nitrogen on the shift base or imine is sp2 hybridized, right? Mm -hmm. Where the other one is technically sp3 hybridized. Mm -hmm. And which orbital would you expect to be larger and therefore more available for bonding? Yeah. Um, so with respect to that, if we're talking about orbital hybridization, I would, yeah, then, then the, you know, the reduced form would be a little bit more better because you'd have stronger orbital overlap with respect to the copper um, D orbitals and the SP orbitals that you're going to be provided by um, with this amine, essentially. <clears throat> I think you have a strong argument, though, about the resonance sort of effects of the, the aniline that you're using being more, uh, being less basic, essentially. Mm. Um, so my other question is, could you go back to the slide where you have the syntheses of each one of these ligands? Yep. Let me, this one good? Yeah, that's fine. So, um, so you have to add T, uh, triethylamine, so base to mm -hmm. these. Yeah. Um, do you have a, uh, maybe a kind of explanation as to why it's necessary to add a base, um, at least yeah. to the bottom two, probably to the top one as well would be useful, but not, this, not necessary maybe. Yeah, um, so from the standpoint, so triethylamine in this case with the base, um, if we think about adding a proton source to this solution, essentially, say we just scrapped the triethylamine, we made it a really acidic solution, we would, let me see, is that, yeah, okay. The addition of this base essentially is going to ensure that this electron pair here on this nitrogen, this amine, is going to be prevalent for um, a nucleophilic attack. Because if you recall, nitrogen is something that really likes to, doesn't like, it, it likes to have a positive charge more so than a carbonyl does. Um, so triethylamine will be introduced in order to ensure that this is available for a nucleophilic attack. Um, another interesting thing with triethylamine in the case of these two systems, L2 and L3, when you add 5 amino acetylic acid, it doesn't dissolve readily. You have to heat it immensely. Um, but as soon as you start to introduce triethylamine, it slowly dissolves into solution which I found really fascinating. I don't know the reason for it. I was trying to figure that out, but I think that might be it exactly with the positive charge potentially, but yeah. Well, so, so these molecules all have carboxylic acids on them mm -hmm. and they have amines on them. Mm -hmm. What's the pK of a carboxylic acid? Uh, carboxylic acid, well, in this case, it's gonna be resonant. With that, that, uh, approximately, if you recall, I believe it was five. Yeah, and what about an ammonium salt? Yeah, the ammonium, I think it was like, what, 40, something like that? Ammonium with a positive charge is 10. 10, 10, yes. Yeah. So I would expect that the reason you're seeing these not dissolve in your solution initially is because they're ionic, right? Mm. They're, they're zwitter ions, essentially. And yeah. when you add the triethylamine, it essentially deprotonates the ammonium salt and makes it so that it's more soluble as a result. Mm. So I think these are kind of almost similar in a way. I mean, they are technically amino acids in that they have an amine and they have a carboxylic acid. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I thought that was pretty interesting that you're, uh, that's a, it's a difficult shift base to make um, because of the carboxylic acids there. Yeah. Anything else? Nope. Very good. Well done. <laughs> awesome.